Hey guys, Kate Sparks here again. I am sick <laughs> and I am tired and I am still here. And my dog wants in and I will be right back. Okay, so for this week's video, um, last week when I was talking about the author event that I was at in St. John's, I mentioned that I was doing some location scouting for, and now my dog's in here. Hi there. Um, I mentioned that I was doing some location scouting for the next book that I'm going to be working on, uh, which is actually a series of, I'm not sure if they're going to fall more firmly into urban fantasy or paranormal romance, and I'm going to be releasing those under a pen name, which is definitely a topic for another video. Anyway, those are going to be set in St. John's and various locations in Newfoundland. So I mentioned that I was doing location scouting for that so I could work on my world building and I mentioned that we could talk about that in the next video and there was some interest in that so that's what we're going to do today. Please lie down. Sit. Sit. Thank you. And the dryer's going. World building. This is a huge topic and I don't want to make this video too long so we're just going to cover a few basic things that I do when I'm working on a book. Uh, go over a little bit about the things that I think about when I'm creating a world and then if there are any questions or anything I will do my best to answer those in the comments rather than tacking another video on here. The world building that I'm doing right now is a bit different from what I usually do. When I'm writing high fantasy, that is fantasy that is set in a world that is not our own, I have to build everything from the ground up. Uh, so what that means is that I need to think about what sort of people or creatures we're dealing with. Uh, obviously in the case of Into Illurian, we weren't dealing with a lot of humans in that other world. Uh, they were monsters who made up the population of the city at the time of the story. But in the case of the Bound trilogy, we were dealing with people. Um, but we were dealing with several different cultures. Uh, and I love doing this. Um, I love exploring, I love researching um, if there are things that sort of connect with the history of our own world. One note on that, <clears throat> fantasy doesn't have to be medieval and it doesn't have to align exactly with any one culture or time period in our own world. Some people seem to think that it does uh, they will complain about anachronisms in fantasy worlds, um, which is totally valid. I mean, if that bothers you in a story, then that's fine. I personally don't see any reason why a world with magic and with a history that's completely different from ours would necessarily develop along the same timelines as our world, uh, especially the same timeline as any one culture in our world. Um, so that's just my personal take on it. I think authors should have absolute freedom to create their worlds as long as it makes sense internally. If you can explain how the world got to where it is, you're golden as far as I'm concerned. Obviously things like if you have a world where everybody has super powerful magic but they don't use it to solve everyday problems, something like that, if you can't explain it logically, um, that might make your world building a bit less believable than it would otherwise be. Um, but generally, as long as it makes sense and um, you're solid on the details and everything, go for it. Create the world that you want to create. What kind of stuff do I look at when I'm building a world? I will look at um, whether or not there's magic in the world. That is a big thing. Um, if it's a fantasy world, there's a good chance that it does and you're going to work on building your magic system. Um, how do people get magic? How do people control magic? What effect does it have on their lives? Um, and importantly, what are the consequences of using magic? Is this just something that flows through everybody and anybody can use it and there are no consequences? Um, or is it something like uh, it causes you physical pain to use magic or it, magic can be drained? Uh, you have a set amount over your lifetime maybe and when you use it, it's gone. Or maybe it can be replenished, uh, but slowly. And limiting magic in that way is a really good idea because it creates obstacles. And without obstacles, your story is not going to be that interesting. If magic can just solve the problems, 
that's it. That's your story. It's done. Uh, you really need obstacles, so consequences for magic are a very good thing. And then whether or not there's magic will kind of affect everything else. You'll want to look at the level of technology of your society. Um, are they using horse-drawn carts? Do they have cars? Do they have trains? Is it a steampunk kind of thing? And if so, what kind of technology are they running with that? Uh, or maybe it's a really high-tech world. Maybe they have computers and laser beams and uh, I don't know. I, I haven't really done a world like that. I'm sort of working on one, um, but I'm not really ready to talk about that one yet. But speaking of steampunk, where do they get their power from? Do they use steam? Do they use solar power, wind power, whatever? Um, it's a good idea to know where they get that, if they're using electricity or that kind of power at all. Maybe they just, they have their mills running by the river and, and they've got horses pulling their <clears throat> farm equipment. Sorry, I'm really... <laughs> I'm sick. I'm on cold medication. I'm not doing so good here. <clears throat> but you see what I mean. You want to know what you're looking at so you can keep that consistent through the book and you know how that technology can either help or hinder your characters in whatever their quest happens to be. How does their culture work? How do people interact with each other? What are the sort of levels of society? Like what are the high class people? Who are the middle class people? If any. Who are the lower class people? What do they do? What are their roles in society? Do they interact with each other? Yada yada yada. What's their fashion like? What kind of clothes do they wear? That's something that came up a little bit in Into Illurian, uh, talking about how the human fashions kind of symbolized their control over monsters. Um, so that was a small thing, but that's a little bit of world building that I'm quite proud of. That kind of world building, I could spend months doing that. I could spend years doing that. I could do a whole lot of research and brainstorming and come up with really cool stuff that would never make it into the story. And I try really hard not to do that. I just want to say that you are welcome to do that. You can absolutely build as detailed a world as you want. You can create languages if you want to. You can do maps of an entire world that might never come into the story. Um, that's totally up to you. I personally, uh, I try to do as much world building as will allow me to write the first draft of the story, uh, just so I have the basics, so I know what kind of a world I'm working with, and then I start writing. Um, and as I write, I will discover other questions that I need answered. Um, the project that I recently set aside started out as sort of a lower tech thing, and I realized the story would work a lot better with a higher level of technology, uh, so I changed it. And as the characters went through the story, they were meeting with obstacles where, or even just situations where I had to answer questions about, okay, how does the library system work? How does the school system work? So I answered those questions for myself as I went through. It's great to know a lot about your world. It doesn't all have to make it into the story. You want to avoid putting more information in your world there than is necessary for the reader to understand the story. Um, that's info dumping, that can get really boring, and there's a huge temptation for us to do it because we do put so much work into building these worlds and creating all this really cool stuff. Um, I know in the Bound Trilogy, um, I've got a huge history of the Tyrian royal family that is super cool and uh, most of it didn't make it in there because it wasn't relevant to the story and it really would have slowed down the pacing of the books. This time, uh, what I'm doing is I'm setting a series of books in our world, sort of. It is our world. The books are set in Newfoundland. The first book is set specifically in St. John's. But it's sort of another world layered on top of that. Uh, it's a supernatural world that, as far as we know, doesn't actually exist. Um, so I am creating, okay, I'll tell you, is vampires. Um, as well as other things. They have their own unique society that exists within the city and within our world. So while it's great that I have the city there, um, I don't need to make a map because I've already got one, I still have to answer a lot of the same questions. I have to answer questions about the social structure of vampires. I have to answer questions about 
whether and how they interact with humans on any level other than considering them food. Do they use human technology or do they have their own? Religion will be a big thing because we're dealing with creatures who used to be living humans. So obviously they all carry baggage from their old lives, even if they try not to. So these are all questions that need to get answered. Uh, who has the power in their society? Who doesn't? How do they interact with each other? Um, do they form friendships? How does being a basically immortal being affect you long term? I always have serious questions when characters who are hundreds of years old fall in love with humans who are decidedly less mature than them, I guess, less experienced. So I want to answer questions about how does that affect you? Um, what's it like for a vampire who's 500 years old to see this sudden explosion of technology that we've had in the past few decades? What do they think of living humans when they have seen so much of history and they've basically probably left their own humanity behind? These are all questions that are part of world building. Uh, these are not specific just to my individual characters. It's world building. Um, they're things that I'm very curious about and very excited about and I'm trying really hard not to get bogged down in the world building stage because I do need to get to redrafting this first book. So I am using St. John's as my backdrop. I did do some location scouting. I need to go back and do some more. I'm not going to talk too much about contemporary world building because I don't write contemporary. I write speculative fiction. I create my own worlds even if those are worlds within worlds. But I would say that even if you are setting something in this world, um, as I did at the beginning of Into Illurian, uh, well, you've got a couple of options. You're either setting it in an existing place, you're sticking your characters in New York City or Toronto or Northern Manitoba or wherever you're putting them. Um, if it's a real place, you're gonna wanna do your research on that area. Uh, if your character has a job, you're gonna wanna know what their job entails and what the corporate structure is like and uh, you know what working there is like and how that affects the rest of their life. You're gonna wanna know where they socialize, you're gonna wanna know where they meet people, you're gonna... all these kinds of things. You're not necessarily building the world, but you wanna have a really solid understanding of it. Because that's the thing, uh, with any book the setting doesn't necessarily have to be such a huge thing that it almost becomes its own character, although that is wonderful uh, if you can do it. A unique setting is a beautiful thing if it's not overdone. But you do want it to feel real. Uh, you want to have enough detail that the reader feels like they are there. So if it's a real city, you want to get as many details right as you can. Your other option, of course, is to create your own city. Uh, which I did, again, in Into Illurian. Uh, Fairbrook is a fictional town. It is based in reality. And now Jehovah's Witnesses are here. I can't catch a break today. I will be back. Okay, now I really have no idea what I was saying. I feel like we were talking about uh, creating a fictional town. Oh, uh, long story short, uh, the more you can ground your fictional locations in reality, the more believable they will be for readers, the more natural they will feel, and uh, the more smoothly things are going to go. I guess that's about it for this topic. If you have questions about specifics of how I do things, or what kind of research I do, or if you're stuck on something and you have a question, uh, leave a comment for me. <clears throat> I'm gonna go take a pill and maybe make some honey lemon tea and get back to work. I'm actually basically done my world building for this story, so I'm going to start on my outline today. So please wish me luck. Uh, thanks for joining me. Thanks for putting up with my interruptions and my rough voice and everything else. And I will talk to you next time.